Good morning. Uh, thank you uh, for being, being invited to speak here uh, to Robert and to Ivan and uh, have the opportunity to build on some of the things that uh, George just uh, laid a good foundation for. Um, I'd like to talk about um, autopsy silence and solid uh, in general. I'd like to talk a little bit about the inherent properties of these materials. We learned uh, quite a bit about the inherent properties of pork and brownstone and then put that specifically in the context of things that go on in the story you mentioned. Um, and we use that uh, as a model for any kind of conservation project in which you have a, a, uh, a treatment material, uh, an inherent material of the building, and then there's the exposure that it's, uh, uh, that it's experiencing. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors here, Craig Olszewski, a graduate student who is now uh, being hired by Building Conservation Associates, and Carola Garcia Manzana, who's um, in the archaeology department at Columbia. And now for the magic one. Um, just a quick little background, there are no new ideas. Uh, <laughs> uh, Tetrasoxy Simon was first um, synthesized in 1846 and in 1851 it was suggested as a stone consolidant and we've been really fooling around for the last 120 years or so uh, to try to make these things actually work and understand their properties. They were made into uh, commercial products as early as the 20s by E.G. Lorry and certainly um, uh, Backer, as we all know, um, patented the uh, formulation that is similar, if not the same as what we use today. So that's um, kind of the, the uh, trajectory of progress, um, that's the right word, in using these materials. Don't want to go deeply into the chemistry. Basically, we're starting with a um, mobile liquid um, uh, based on something like tetraethoxyphylene and, and small ligaments of it, and uh, hydrolyzing it with water and producing silica gel which is essentially the same as those little packets of materials you see when you buy electronic um, equipment, making a silicate polymer, again, in the form um, of a gel. So what are some of the basic things you like about toxic silence? One is, as uh, George mentioned about some of his treatments, they're, they're quite low in viscosity and surface tension. Um, so they're very mobile liquids. We'll also see in a few minutes we've got something we don't like about them as well. Uh, one of the reasons we put so much attention into these materials is their unique stability. Silicon oxides and silicon bonds do not break down in solar UV. They're not oxidized. Um, so they're a relatively stable material, as we understand by all the silicate minerals that are in the in their surface crust. Uh, just a little bit about this property of surface tension. Water, as you know, has a very high surface tension. It's something we might call uh, a narcissistic molecule. It really loves itself and hold on to it, whereas um, uh, things like alkoxy violence do not like themselves very much. They're self-loading materials, and they lay down the surface and can bring in very well. So they, they really do run, if you will. So these are some, some things we like about alkoxy violence when trying to apply them to a course material. What don't we like about alkoxy violence development? Well, the risk is longer. Uh, low viscosity and surface tension. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Relatively long curing time. This makes jobs for contractors very difficult logistically uh, to make sure the stone is dry beforehand, give it enough time, not exposed to rainwater for it to cure, and to develop the, the good properties it might have. During that long curing time, they're also water repellent. Even though the gel itself in the end is not water repellent, during the curing time, they are. You can't carry out any activity nearby it that will involve water, like patching. Uh, um, pointing things of that nature. And again, they are inherently immiscible with water. So if you have water in the stone and your treatment material is moving in, it will, it will develop a reaction at the interface um, that will precipitate the gel in place that you may not want it to be. Uh, color changes were mentioned just a few moments ago. There can be significant color changes that are rather persistent with the uh, alkoxy filing. Because of the water issue, it is often difficult to clean after you consolidated those materials. And um, the gels themselves can't produce very large gaps. There's some discussion among the scientists about how big this number is, but 50 microns is very small. And this has an uh, important consequences for a place like the story of the end. Well, as I said, low viscosity is a blessing and a curse. It, it goes on and, and it, it goes into the stone really well, and it also goes everywhere else. So if you are trying to, as perhaps you might want to do in the story mansion, treat an isolated area, you have to isolate that area from the rest of the material because it will run. Um, the color changes can persist for years. This is a stone uh, in the lab that's been exposed now for three years and it has still retained.
see the difference in color. And notice also the, um, the water account is, um, that is retained as, uh, after at least several months when it's not exposed in an outdoor environment. Again, you can't go back and do water-related treatment nearby um, this material. Alcoxy silence will screw up the curing of waters if you treat them on uh, areas that the newly installed waters are catching materials. On the other hand, if you bring water in contact with um, alcoxy silence, that will screw up its um, curing. Uh, again, water immiscibility. There's a big lump of, of uh, liquid alkoxy silane uh, that can take contour at least in the bottom of this container of water. It does not mix with water. The gels and alkoxy silane are not good adhesives, and they're not good gas raising materials. So if we look at one of the main uh, manifestations of deterioration that Victoria mentioned, which is the scale and flaking and falling. You can't expect this alkoxy silane gel to bridge those gaps and adhere those things back together. We're talking about something on the order of 50 microns as an ability to bridge the gap. Very, very tiny space. Um, here's a, a, an example of a, um, of a limestone which has rather large pores. Um, these are probably on the order of about 300 uh, microns. This is the size of a, of a piece of gel that you're going to get in there. So it cannot bridge those gaps caused by the delamination, the flaking, scaling, and falling that you see uh, often with Portland Brown. I want to look at some specific considerations for Portland Brownstone um, at, uh, at Victoria Mansion. And again, emphasizing the point that it's not going to cure um, this manifestation of deterioration. It's not going to mend the current condition. Uh, we might be able to slow down future deterioration. And um, just to give you a sense of, uh, this is a, a thin section of the um, Portland brownstone from uh, Victoria Mansion, uh, which is in plain polarized light. The blue is the size of the four spaces, and here's a, a, a bar of 300 microns. So notice a lot of these spaces here are on the order of 50 microns or less, so that in the case of Portland brownstone, on the micro scale, we can hope to introduce the liquid and bridge some of the gaps from grain to grain, but not from large uh, structures like flaking, scaling, and falling. Uh, what I want to focus on mostly today is some new work we've done uh, with mechanical testing of uh, Portland brownstone, in which we've uh, made slices of the stone, uh, and these slices are approximately 50 millimeters across and 2.5 millimeters thick. Uh, and then subjected them to a biaxial flexure stress, which is uh, again developed by some of our, our German colleagues, um, in which you place the sample on a larger ring and then pins the smaller ring onto the sample and then look at its deformation and ultimate uh, failure. One of the reasons we like to use this test is to get a lot of samples out of one piece of stone. Um, and in addition, if you're in, uh, looking at um, evaluating treatments that have been done in the field, you can take a core drill through the external wall and look at the depth of penetration and the change in, in the properties with that depth um, over time. I'm not advocating drilling hundreds of uh, two-inch uh, diameter holes in Victoria Mansion, um, but this is a, a very good way of evaluating um, that condition. Um, I just want to uh, give a little bit of, or actually quite a bit of, quite a bit of stress strain data. Um, uh, based on, on the uh, test. So on the left-hand side, we have the applied load, um, and on the right-hand side, the strain or the displacement of, of that uh, second head. And the, the actual plot is the black line, and I've taken some li a liberty here to draw in a blue line, which did not conform to any of the typical protocols for measuring uh, stiffness or, or elastic modulus, um, but I didn't want to um, uh, get it in the way of the black line. So this is uh, a way of looking at how stiff the sample is. The more steep the graph, the more stiff is the sample. And just comparing uh, the long metal with, with Portland, one notices uh, in the stress strain curve that Portland is actually quite a bit uh, stronger than long metal, um, and in fact is inherently uh, somewhat stiffer. So this is long metal uh, and Portland uh, untreated. We haven't done anything to this yet. So just looking at how the stone is formed uh, in, uh, in relation to uh, uh, the stress. These are, in this case, all cut, those discs are all cut parallel to the bed and plane. So this is, uh, and these are all uh, 10 samples uh, each, um, with the exception of one uh, example at the end. So one of the things I want to look 
look at is what happens when we treat the, the samples um, in the lab, um, as the sample desk from before, and how do we treat these? This is, I, this is a set of ideal conditions. We're learning how good we could possibly be with these treatments. I'll use the word good in quotes. How good we can be with these treatments um, uh, versus what may happen in the field. So notice, um, if we go back a little bit, Notice how much more deep the graphs get. These materials are becoming much, much thicker. Maybe not such a good thing as we saw in relation to uh, George's data just a few moments ago. And that um, we have two things occurring with Longmeadow. It's getting, you know, relatively much stronger. It's not as strong as two before them, but relatively much stronger. 250% increases versus 80, and a 550% increase in stiffness. So we might not. Uh, um, be concerned about treating long meadow and increasing the stiffness that much. Portland also a relatively high increase in stiffness, um, uh, not as, again as high as long meadow, um, but an 80 percent increase in, in the load at failure. So we're getting some additional strength um, by this treatment, and we want to see if that's useful for us or not. Now, as George mentioned, looking at stones when they are wet as well, we measured the, the strength of uh, Portland, untreated Portland, when it's dry. And this is the same graph we saw untreated before. And then when it's wet. Um, and notice that the, the modulus does change somewhat. The stiffness changes somewhat. A little slower, of, of, um, the slope is a little to less. Um, but in relative terms, it's not that much weaker. This is only uh, about a 30% loss in strength in being wet. Um, that may be some good news for Portland. Many other stones are much weaker when they are wetter. We want to also look at, um, when we have treated uh, Portland, what happens, um, these are both treated samples now. Again, this is how good it is when it's uh, dry and treated. What if you saturate the sample with water and then break it after it's been treated? And notice we do have a decrease um, in the strength uh, here. But it's similar to the decrease in strength that occurs just from untreated samples going from dry to wet. The other thing that to notice is that this, this strength here um, of the wet material is actually higher than the uh, untreated stone while it's dry. So again, the treatment is helping a little bit in terms of uh, uh, strengthening the stone in conditions that it might be exposed to here in Victoria Mansion. Now, one of the things we believe occurs when you treat sandstone with alkoxy thiolin is because of the similarity, chemical similarity between the uh, treatment material and the stone. That means the stone is made up of silicate minerals like quartz and feldspar and clay, which is a silicate mineral, and the gel is that we do actually get some bonding that occurs between the gel um, and, the, and the stone substrate. And one of the things that we see when we treat limestone versus sandstone the sandstones get much higher strength increases and higher strength because of this bonding effect. So one of the things that will probably occur when you uh, wet um, treated stone is that you'll start breaking some of those bonds between the minerals and the gel. That, that may be, in fact, part of this difference in, in the strength that occurs here. So what happens then if you take this wet treated stone and let it dry again? Do those things reform? And do you regain the strength you had before um, now that it's dried after it's been wet? So we did that experiment and noticed that um, this is the stone that's treated, saturated, and then dried. And again, if we go back one, notice this is where the treated is uh, here while it's wet. And then if we go forward, if we dry it again, we essentially regain all of the strength we had before. So there is, um, in this single experiment, this is one cycle now. We don't uh, immediately lose all of the value of, of the treatment through that one cycle. So perhaps um, the, the bonds that we believe form, and we do have some pretty good data that these bonds do form, uh, are reformed after wetting and then drying again. So a typical condition that Victoria mentioned where it gets wet and then dries again. Well, one of the things we, we like to do is, uh, um, and I would like to use George's uh, um, apparatus, but we've done wet drying cycles as well to examine both what happens to the stone and both and what happens to the treated stone. So if we look at um, a treat, a, uh, untreated stone that's been cycled, 
we know that in fact, this is only 20 cycles, so this is uh, not a long period of time. But what we know that with uh, untreated Portland cycles is in fact it, it doesn't change its property very much on that time scale. I think it would be worthwhile doing many more cycles than this. Here's a treated stone with no cycles. And then after only about 20 cycles, and these again are an average of, of 10 samples, we see a real change in the strength of the treated material. So the, uh, the untreated stone, in fact, doesn't change very much in 20 cycles. The treated stone does begin to change uh, on the order of 10 or 15 percent. What's that telling us? That's telling us that our treatment is starting to lose effectiveness in a relatively short period of time. And I think we should extend these cycles uh, more to see where the bottom line is on this. But uh, again, our treatment is starting to lose some of its, its effectiveness in a fairly short period of time as measured by the um, strength measurements. And uh, one of the, and of course, wetting and drying is an important uh, um, condition here at the uh, Victoria Mansion, and of course in other places as well. Uh, but another uh, condition that we see with the freeze thaw cycles, and uh, here we have samples um, with no freeze thaw cycles, and, and we used a, a, um, a cycling uh, to minus 10 degrees Celsius, and then back to room temperature on the order of about four hours um, at a time. And notice that um, it actually appears that after 20 freeze thaw cycles, the stone's getting a little bit stronger. Um, the stiffness is, is fairly similar. Um, but then again, in 20 cycles, freezing isn't doing a lot to the stone itself. Maybe even improving a little bit, maybe depositing some little grains of material between the grains that are causing it to be, uh, in this test, a little stronger or a little stiffer. And now look at the treated Portland stone. Um, again, with no cycles, and then after 20 cycles, we've already begun to see a loss of something on the order of uh, 15, 12% uh, of the strength. These are, are, are real differences, uh, averaging out um, over, again, 10 samples. So similar to the wetting and drying, uh, we're be beginning to lose some of the effectiveness of the treatment after only 20 free thaw cycles. So two conditions that are, that are prominent here as Victoria mentioned, wetting, drying, freezing, thawing. The stone is not changing a whole lot in 20 cycles. We're getting uh, appreciable differences in uh, the consolidation material. So again, we're losing effectiveness of the consolidation. And again, um, with the treated material, I want to emphasize that the, the slope of this graph is much, much higher, but the material is much stiffer. So uh, if we go back to the hybrid swelling problem, we're, we're amazing to creating a condition that's uh, less favorable um, to, to that um, uh, part of the, of the deterioration mechanism of Portland sandstone here. Um, one of the things that's done, and I just now wanted to shift uh, for a few minutes to what we do in the field, and that is one of the common uh, phenomena, uh, phenomena, phenomena, uh, that occurs in the field is that we get an uh, excess uh, consolidant on the surface as we're applying it, and the, the uh, manufacturer, Hansberg or H, Bach or H, suggests you apply acetone or any K to the surface to get, get rid of that glazing effect. Uh, so you don't get um, uh, excess consolidant on the surface. So one of the things I was concerned about is if you do that, do you then uh, cause a problem in, in the actual strength increase of the treatment? So uh, conditions to remove an aesthetic effect would it uh, influence the mechanical properties. And here's the treated material uh, again uh, with no acetone. When you apply the acetone, you get a uh, good this. In fact, it's getting a little stronger, maybe redistributing some of the consolidants better between the grains. Um, but it's not causing a, a, a diminution of the strength of the material uh, by applying that acetone to reduce the glazing effect. So, for a field condition, that, that's uh, a good thing for us to know. Um, the, as George mentioned, how stiff this material gets is, is also important in terms of how it deteriorates. Um, uh, and George also mentioned the company Remmer. They produce a couple of consolidation formulations that have elastomeric materials in it in an attempt to make both the gel that forms and the treated stone less stiff. Um, so we, we thought, well, maybe it would be a good idea to compare some of these products 
to what the typical conservar arrays or blocker arrays were using, which is just a methyl silicate and uh, a dihydro and dilaurate catalyst. So here's our the graph of our typical um, conservar OH, and here's the same material uh, with an elastomeric component. And notice that the slope of the graph is almost exactly the same. It's slightly less dip, but. Elastomeric material isn't really giving us a, a uh, significant difference in that statement. Whatever that formulation is, in fact, we know what it is. It's uh, some uh, silicon resin uh, attached to some of the uh, uh, epoxy filing polymers. It doesn't manifest itself uh, in treating Portland sand stone. Uh, maybe other stones that would have more of a significant effect, it does not have a significant effect on, on Portland sand stone. And again, so we just are adding some of these linear segments uh, to give a little bit of flexibility to the gel and hopefully transferring some of that flexibility to the stone. And again, very little of that is transferred to the treated material. So we're not gaining a whole lot in the, in the as we stated, property change um, that these treatment materials are uh, designed to do. Uh, the thought being, do we want to start importing some of these materials from Germany? because they have magically better properties than what we already have here. And for Portland sandstone, I would say probably not. Um, the, the, another product, um, which is an elastomeric material from uh, Remmers as well, has a little bit higher molecular weight, slightly higher viscosity, not significantly higher, called 500 STD, comparing that to OH. Actually, this one is a little stiffer than ROA. So we're not gaining anything from the elastomeric properties of the material. It's higher molecular weight does produce a, a, an appreciable higher strength increase. So we're, we're all up here at maybe 225 meters, um, rather than on the order of 180 to 185. So as is a common higher molecular weight material usually does produce higher strength. And we do see that um, uh, here in the 500 SPV versus the, the typical OH. Um, not coming out to be less um, stiff. So I think that's also an important thing for us to know. Do we want to import this material for Portland uh, brownstone? Probably not. And having said that, we can probably just give you this material from uh, things we can buy or off the shelf anyway. We don't have to import it from Germany. They don't have any patents here. Um, so I think that's an important thing for us to know as well. Um, <coughs> mixed up with my hands. Um, this to me is a very important uh, set of graphs, so I'd, I'd like to go through this uh, carefully. Um, this is following the protocol that the, the Germans developed in the early 80s, uh, testing um, some things that, uh, uh, in Munich, where they've actually gone out of the field and treated uh, the building as they would um, in a typical application by a conservator, core drilling the, the uh, building from the space and slicing uh, through in depth and looking at the different strengths as we move in depth. Uh, we, use, we did this with a core and, and uh, followed the typical conservar protocol treatment protocol one minute in, five minutes out, one minute in, five minutes out for nine cycles, which is fairly typical for um, a tree, uh, consolidating the stone in the field. And then we spliced this thing up in depth and looked at how the, the strength changed in depth. And this to me is actually a fairly disturbing uh, graph. Um, here's the graph for the first flight. And actually, we got a, a, a little better strength increase in this case than we got in, in most of the samples we had treated earlier, uh, which they were down about 180, 185. So we're up here. We'll call this good for the moment. Um, we got a good, a high strength increase. We go into the next dip, and we're down here below. Of uh, the treatment that we did in the lab, we're down here about 165. We go to the third disc, we're down here at 130, and the fourth, fifth, and sixth, we're down here to untreated material. What does this mean? Remember, these discs are 2.5 millimeters in thickness. Within 2.5 millimeters, our strength has dropped uh, from 230 to, to 170. What we're saying is we're not getting good enough depth of penetration. Um, and down here at uh, five millimeters in, we're already approaching the level of untreated stone. 
we have to be incredibly careful and good about how we do our field treatments if we want to make sure we get good depth of penetration. What is that? What might that mean practically? We probably have to dilute these materials um, with solvent, as has been done uh, in Europe. And, and to do that, we get better depth of penetration, perhaps a more even uh, strength uh, profile. Um, and now we're out of VOC compliance. Uh, uh, take a couple of minutes to summarize um, and give you uh, some photos uh, in relation to each of these summary points. Uh, Alpoxytonin do cause significant change in color in, in uh, many stones, particularly the dark colored stones. Um, and we do see that in Portland uh, brown stones. With Portland, uh, the color change is much less severe than it is in long metal, and it does abate over time. And I want to emphasize the word abate. It doesn't necessarily go away. It usually goes down to about a 10 or 5 percent difference in, in coloration. So that's an important consideration. Time frame that can be on the order of years to get down to that 10 or 5 percent point. So you need to know that before you uh, run out and, and treat that and, and see how long it might take for it to go away and whether that's acceptable to you or not. Um, and it may not be. On the other hand, you might go and use this material to treat those lighter colored new stones that are installed uh, and make them dark, dark and up a little bit. Second point, this is really important for us to understand because I think we are oversold some of these materials over the years. Over the years. But hockey time is not one of the main, main, one of the main manifestations of deterioration of Victoria Mansion, scaling, flaking, and falling. The gaps are too big. It's not a good adhesive. It's not a good uh, gap bridging material. You can't ask it to do that. It will not do it. You need grout injections, adhesives of the more typical types of use in conservation in many of those conditions. It will make the stone somewhat stronger and perhaps resist free uh, uh, thought uh, uh, longer, but not that long. So again, we can't ask these materials to do things that they're not designed to do. And try to be honest about whether the good and bad things of these materials. So, a toxic silent enthusiast noticeable increase in strength and stiffness of the Portland brownstone. This may be a, a good or a bad thing. Again, with, with, with respect to hybrid swelling, and making it much more stiff may not be a good thing to do. So, we have to be careful about what we're, we think we're gaining when we use these tools. The strength increase will, again, slow down some of the effects, slow down some of the effects of freeze thaw and, and uh, wetting and drying. It will not make them go away. So free thaw and wet dry cycles reduce the performance of autopsy silent consolidants, i.e. The, the consolidants themselves are affected by free thaw and wet dry in a way that reduces their performance. Such that we should consider these maintenance materials and not restoration materials. And by a restoration like material, I think of something that you apply and it, it uh, holds on to most of its performance for 25 years or longer. You're not going to get that out of these consolidants on Portland sandstone. It's going to be more like painting your house than it is building a new house. These are maintenance materials, they are not restoration materials. We're talking about applications on an order of five and ten years. And knowing the logistical issues in relation to applying these consolidants making sure the building is dry, making sure it's protected from rainwater, uh, not being able to carry out other activities while these things are curing. It's a real deterrent to their use um, in, uh, as a maintenance material. So you have to understand, again, what these properties are before you jump ahead and, and consider using them. In a place like Port, uh, uh, Victoria Mansion, a isolated section uh, can be treated, but certainly as an overall treatment, it would be very difficult to carried out, like painting your house, by like doing it everywhere. <coughs> uh, and just to emphasize again, we get loss in the performance of the treatment through these wet dry cycles as well as, uh, uh, as the free thaw cycle. So we think the, the treatment that's being effective in those in this short period of time, 20 cycles, then uh, the treatment is being much more effective than the stone. Now, I haven't shown this here because um, I wanted to emphasize this new data, but one of the things we do know about Alcoxy Island um, in, uh, with respect to granular disintegration on stones like Portland sandstone is this is a very useful treatment. 
that it will reduce granular disintegration for uh, longer periods of time than uh, it will uh, hold on to these strength increases. Um, and that is a condition that is at Portland, uh, as the Victoria mentioned. There are areas where uh, in Ivan's talk he shows, well, we're not going to try to replace this with new material, but there is some erosion. In those localized uh, conditions of, uh, of granular disintegration, we will get a pretty good improvement in the performance. So that would be an area where you might consider using a toxic silence here, again, rather than an overall uh, does not cause a diminution in the, in the performance of the consolidant. So if you do get this glazing effect and you want to wash it away with acetone or methyl ethyl ketone, you're not going to be stripping out all of the consolidation material from the surface. So you will, you will retain whatever uh, good properties you got by that initial treatment. Uh, so I can continue doing that in the field to keep it uh, from the glazing effect. And this is really important. Care must be taken in field applications to ensure the sufficient depth of penetration of the consolidant. This, this graph, I, as I said before, is very disturbing to the 2.5 millimeters to lose 40% um, of the effectiveness of the treatment and, and virtually all of the effectiveness of treatment down to 5 millimeters. The traditional wisdom in with these consolidants is you need a minimum of 1 centimeter, 10 millimeters for depth of penetration. So, um, on the order of uh, five uh, millimeters, we've lost all of the effectiveness of treatment. So this uh, protocol that is uh, suggested by uh, Prosoko and uh, the Vaca literature is not enough for the Tory Mansion. You have to let this stuff sit there longer and penetrate better and do some of this testing to understand, uh, sorry, do some of this testing to find out what does that protocol look like for Portland. And uh, I should emphasize that um, all these tests were done on only mildly weathered material. A lot of it actually from the historic mansion, the, the material that was removed in 88. More severely eroded material will take in the liquid faster. So you need to understand the conditions on the building and how it influences the uptake of the consolidant and then how, how it affects the, the strength depth uh, profile, which is a very important term for conditions, particularly for this building. The elastomer modified alkoxycyanins don't significantly reduce the stiffness. So the stated uh, advantage of elastomeric materials as formulated by Bremers doesn't really play out on foil. Um, some of the data from some of the German sandstones that have been uh, tested over the years is, are better than this. But again, we're, we're talking about Portland here, and it doesn't really do that much for you. Um, so we don't need to, to run out and try to uh, import this um, from Germany. However, However, products containing elastomers or these more highly polymerized ethylsilicate materials may conform to the new DOT uh, 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 regulations. That is, higher molecular weight materials leave more stuff behind so less evaporates. So um, there may be an advantage for both the elastomeric, because remember the elastomeric material is basically a solid that will never go away. If we increase the elastomeric component and increase the molecular weight a little bit, we may conform to DOC, to raise the molecular weight, we may reduce or increase the viscosity and reduce the depth of penetration. So that's a, that's a playoff that um, we need to look at. But these new regulations are in place. Um, my colleague Norman Weiss and I have been discussing uh, testing DOC on these and other materials. And what we suspect is uh, you know, most of the material that comes off of ethyl silicates is, is ethanol. And the VOC on a martini is actually much, much higher than it is on the, on the ethyl silicate material. So we're going to see if we can outlaw martini and uh, see how well that goes. Um, but I do believe we can reduce the, uh, uh, the VOC on some of these materials uh, enough to comply so that uh, if the regulations ever do work their way up to Maine, uh, we still may be able to supply you with, with a 